Hi, I'm John Copeland from Fox Valley Cart, and welcome to another of our instructional videos. One of the questions we get asked a lot is, how can I get my two-cycle engine to turn more RPM? Why are other racers turning their engines tighter than I am? There are a number of factors that impact how many RPM, how tight a two-cycle engine will turn. Some of those are things that you can't control, but there are a number of things that you can adjust and tune for. Two-cycle engine builders have a certain amount of flexibility in how they set an engine up. Things like port timing and ignition and combustion chamber configuration are all things the engine builder can adjust to a certain degree. And you need to talk to your engine builder and ask them, how can you get more low end? How can you get more top end? How can you get more RPM? Whatever it is that you need. But once you get to the track, you pretty much have to work with what you've got. In general, the four most common variables that impact engine RPM are gear ratio, carb settings, exhaust configuration, and chassis drag. Let's start with carb settings. Most of you know how important it is to get the carb mixture right, but let's take a second and go over a couple of the basics. On most two-cycle cart engines, the carb pumps fuel from the fuel tank up to the carb, then meters it into the venturi of the carb to mix with the incoming air and supply the engine. You can adjust the volume of fuel by turning the adjusting needles on the carburetor. In, or clockwise, for less fuel, or out, counterclockwise, for more fuel. The goal is to get the most efficient combustion of the fuel to create the maximum combustion pressure to drive the piston down. This ratio is called the stoichiometric ratio, and for gasoline, it's 14.7 to 1. That means that the engine needs 14.7 ounces of air for every ounce of fuel to combust most efficiently. But, and this is a big but, air-cooled engines, particularly air-cooled two-cycle engines, are not particularly good at managing heat. So what we need to do is use fuel to help cool the engine. As the fuel goes through the carburetor, it doesn't vaporize, it atomizes. That means it breaks into tiny droplets. And when those droplets hit the top of the piston, they vaporize there, and then the spark plug ignites the fuel and air mixture. But that act of touching the hot piston crown and vaporizing takes a lot of heat off the engine, and that helps us cool the engine down. What all this means is that we need to run the engine a little bit richer than we'd like for ideal combustion because we need the cooling effect. As most of you know, the leaner you run the engine, the hotter it gets. But there's a limit to how hot we can get, and so we've got to use the cooling effect of the fuel to keep the engine within the operating range. Whether you're running cylinder head temperature or exhaust gas temperature, you need to keep an eye on the temps and use that as a guide to help adjust the carburetor. Here's a fundamental of nearly every two-cycle engine. They produce the most torque, consume fuel most efficiently, and generate the most heat all at the same point on the RPM range. For most engines, this is pretty close to the lower end of the usable RPM range, and you'll typically set your clutch engagement RPM just below that point. From the point of peak torque, as RPM go up, the demand for fuel goes down, the torque declines, and heat goes down. As the demand for fuel goes down, without adjusting the carb needles, the mixture gets richer the faster the engine turns. At some point, the mixture gets so rich that the engine can't combust all the fuel on every revolution, and the engine begins to burble, or as most carters refer to it, four cycle. Once the engine starts to four cycle, it won't turn any faster. So the trick, as far as gaining top end RPM is concerned, is to adjust the needles so the engine has enough fuel to run most efficiently at peak torque and be lean enough at top RPMs to wind up higher, all without getting too hot. 
Most two cycle carbs used in carting have two needles, one for the low speed and one for high speed. In most cases, you'll find you'll run the low speed needle richer and the high speed needle leaner to get best performance. But you always need to be mindful of engine temperature. The leaner you get the high speed needle, the hotter the engine will get. Consult your engine builder about recommended temperatures and needle settings, but bear in mind that needle settings will change with air temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure so you'll need to experiment at the track. One of the most reliable indicators of proper carb mixture is the spark plug. You need to learn how to read the plug. That means coming in from practice and removing the spark plug. Looking at the coloration of the porcelain inside the plug above the electrode is what's important. If the porcelain is dark, the mixture is too rich and you need to lean it down a little. If the porcelain is very light or even white, the mixture is too lean and you need to add fuel. What you're looking for is the light brown color of a cardboard box. Now remember that a new spark plug has white porcelain so you need to give it a few laps to color up before you can tell anything from it. And likewise, an old spark plug is almost always going to be dark and you can't tell much from that. The engine will run better and rev higher when the mixture is right. Next up is the exhaust configuration. If you're running a piston port engine with a short can muffler, you can skip on to the next section. The can is what it is and there isn't anything you can do legally to change it. But if you're running a pipe, technically an expansion chamber, the correct setup is critical. First of all, you'll need a pipe that's designed for the type of engine and type of racing that you'll be doing. The pipe for a piston port engine won't give you the results you want for a reed valve engine or a rotary valve engine. So make sure you've got the right pipe to begin with. Pipe design and development has been pretty much static for the last several years, but before that there was a lot of evolution in pipe design, so having a pipe that's a couple of generations old design-wise is a big disadvantage. Consult your engine builder about what pipe he recommends for the type of racing that you're going to do. And don't get fooled just because your pipe sorta of looks like what the fast folks are running. The difference between pipes are subtle and not easy to spot for a less experienced racer. Here's a quick look at how an expansion chamber works and why the setup is so critical. Inside the pipe, there are a pair of tapered cones. The first one starts small and gets bigger. Then it attaches to a shorter cone that starts big and gets smaller. The exhaust gas goes out the hole at the end of the second cone and is, and is quieted by the silencer cans before it exits to the atmosphere. The principle is pretty straightforward. When the piston begins its downward movement, it uncovers the exhaust port. At that moment, a shock wave travels out of the exhaust port at the speed of sound, given the temperature and density of the exhaust gas. As the cross section of the pipe increases in the first cone, the shock wave is amplified. Then the shock wave hits the second cone and the cross sectional area decreases, and that shock wave is reflected back towards the engine. While all this is going on, the piston is continued down and has opened the transfer ports, allowing a fresh charge of fuel-air mixture into the cylinder. Some of that mixture spills out into the exhaust header because of the low pressure that's right behind the shock wave. Now here's the important part. If everything is timed properly, the reflected shock wave arrives at the exhaust port while the piston is on its way back up and just before it closes the exhaust port. That shock wave stuffs the excess fresh charge back into the cylinder just before the port closes. If you could freeze the engine at just the moment that the exhaust port closes, you'd find that you already have higher than atmospheric pressure in the cylinder. But there's a catch. The shock wave has to get back at exactly the right time. This is why it's critically important that you get the exhaust set up right. Keep in mind 
the amount of time it takes the shock wave to begin at the exhaust port, travel down the pipe, and get back is a function of the speed that it travels and the distance that it has to go. And this is where the connector pipe, also known as the flex, comes in. By changing the length of the connector, you can change the overall length of the path for the shock wave to travel. Every pipe has a recommended length, and that length is measured from the face of the piston to the end of the connector. Here's an easy way to measure the pipe length. The distance is always measured from touching the piston to the end of the connector pipe. So take something like this piece of quarter inch dowel rod and reach into, through the connector, through the header until you touch the piston. Then mark the spot at the end of the connector and use a tape measure to measure the overall distance. It's important to get this dimension exactly right. If it's too short, the shock wave gets back too soon and low end suffers. If it's too long, then it takes too long for the shock wave to get back and it hurts top end RPM. Remember, the amount of time it takes the shock wave to get from the exhaust port down to the end of the pipe and back to the exhaust port is fixed for that distance. But the amount of time that the port is open changes with RPM. So there's a specific length that's exactly right for every RPM. But in general, the longer you make the pipe, the more it'll help low end. The shorter you make the pipe, the more it'll help top end. But as you shorten the pipe, it also makes the engine run a little hotter. So these things are all connected. Start by getting the length set to the recommended length for the pipe you're running, or in the case of some classes, to the specified length for that class. See how the engine performs, and then you can adjust from there. Typically, we make those adjustments in quarter inch increments. Another big factor that can influence top end RPM is chassis bind or chassis drag. You remember from looking at the torque curve that once we get past the torque peak, engine torque begins to go down. Well, at the same time, drag, the faster the cart goes, drag goes up. In fact, it goes up at the square of speed. So while the drag is going up, the torque is coming down, at some point those lines will cross. And when they do, the cart simply doesn't have enough torque to push the car any faster, and, you, and that's as fast as it'll go. Drag can come from a number of different sources. It can come from wheel bearings or axle bearings. It can be brake drag. It can be chassis bind, or it can be tires. All those things have a big impact on how fast the car will run. A big source of chassis drag can be bad wheel or axle bearings, so make sure those are in good shape and spin freely. Another big factor is front end setup. If you run too much toe in or too much toe out, that can create a lot of additional drag. And tires are a big source of drag that you can control. Tires that are wider or softer or not properly inflated can kill your performance. If you're gonna get the maximum top end, the cart needs to be light on its feet so you don't waste any of your precious torque. Finally, the proper gear ratio is critical to getting the best performance out of your cart. Whether it's getting off the corner strong or having good top end RPM down the straightaway. In the most general sense, gearing is a matter of compromise. The more teeth you put on the axle, the better your acceleration will be, but at the expense of top speed in mile per hour. Conversely, the, as you take teeth off, you gain top speed, but that, that's at the expense of acceleration. Most beginners run too many teeth on the axle. That's because they have poor cornering technique and they need those extra teeth to help them get off the corner. The net result of running more teeth is that they never develop good cornering technique and they're a sitting duck on the straightaway. The faster folks always run fewer teeth. They have good technique that helps them get off the corner and they can hammer down the straightaways.
Most of the time, if you're not getting the top end RPM you're looking for, the first step is to add a couple of teeth and see if the RPM pick up. But remember, you're trading speed for acceleration. So if you add a couple of teeth and you only get one or 200 more RPM on top end, you actually went slower in terms of mile per hour. As a general rule, you need to get 300 RPM per tooth to have a net gain in top speed. So if you put two, one or two teeth on and you don't see that, take those teeth back off. Then experiment with the other factors. Look at the, look at the carb setting, look at the exhaust setting, make sure you don't have any extra drag in the chassis. Once you've got those all optimized, you can go back to experimenting gear, with gearing. And don't be afraid to take teeth off. Sometimes you can pull the engine down into its RPM range and it'll actually run better. So there you have it, the four most common ways to increase top end RPM. You should always check with your engine builder and let them advise you about what sort of top end RPM you should be seeing with your engine and the type of racing you're doing. But if you get the exhaust configuration right, you get the carburetor set up properly, and you do everything you can to reduce drag and chassis bind, then all you have left to do is experiment with the gearing. And don't be afraid to ask other people in your class what kind of gearing they're running. Their setup may be a little different than yours, but at least you'll know if you're in the ballpark. Thanks for watching this video, and if there are other topics you'd like us to cover, please email us at john at foxvalleycart.com. We'll see you next time.